the book of Luke, chapter 7. When Jesus had finished everything he wanted to say to the people, he went to Capernaum. There, a Roman army officer's valuable slave was sick and near death. The officer had heard about Jesus and sent some Jewish leaders to him. They were to ask Jesus to come and save the servant's life. They came to Jesus and begged, He deserves your help. He loves our people and built our synagogue at his own expense. Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the officer sent friends to tell Jesus, Sir, don't bother. I don't deserve to have you come into my house. That's why I didn't come to you. But just give a command and let my servant be cured. As you know, I'm in a chain of command and have soldiers at my command. I tell one of them, go, and he goes, and another, come, and he comes. I tell my servant, do this, and he does it. Jesus was amazed at the officer when he heard these words. He turned to the crowd following him and said, I can guarantee that I haven't found faith as great as this in Israel. When the men who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant healthy again. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a city called Nain. His disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he came near the entrance to the city, he met a funeral procession. The dead man was a widow's only child. A large crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he felt sorry for her. He said to her, Don't cry. He went up to the open coffin, took hold of it, and the men who were carrying it stopped. He said, Young man, I'm telling you to come back to life. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Everyone was struck with fear and praised God. They said, A great prophet has appeared among us, and God has taken care of his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding region. John's disciples told him about all these things. Then John called two of his disciples and sent them to ask the Lord, Are you the one who is coming, or should we look for someone else? At that time, Jesus was curing many people who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits. Also, he was giving back sight to many who were blind. Jesus answered John's disciples, Go back and tell John what you have seen and heard. Blind people see again. Lame people are walking. Those with skin diseases are made clean. Deaf people hear again. Dead people are brought back to life. And poor people hear the good news. Whoever doesn't lose his faith in me is indeed blessed. When John's messengers had left, Jesus spoke to the crowds about John. What did you go into the desert to see? Tall grass swaying in the wind? Really, what did you go to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? Those who wear splendid clothes and live in luxury are in royal palaces. Really, what did you go to see? A prophet? Let me tell you that he is far more than a prophet. John is the one about whom scripture says, I am sending my messenger ahead of you to prepare the way in front of you. I can guarantee that of all the people ever born, no one is greater than John. Yet, the least important person in the kingdom of God is greater than John. All the people, including tax collectors, heard John. They admitted that God was right by letting John baptize them. But the Pharisees and the experts in Moses' teachings rejected God's plan for them. They refused to be baptized. How can I describe the people who are living now? What are they like? They are like children who sit in the marketplace and shout to each other, We played music for you, but you didn't dance. We sang a funeral song, but you didn't cry. John the baptizer has come, neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say, There's a demon in him. The Son of Man has come, eating and drinking, and you say, Look at him. He's a glutton and a drunk, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is proved right by all its results. One of the Pharisees invited Jesus to eat with him. Jesus went to the Pharisee's house and was eating at the table. A woman who lived a sinful life in that city found out that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she took a bottle of perfume and knelt at his feet. She was crying and washed his feet with her tears. Then she dried his feet with her hair, kissed them over and over again, and poured the perfume on them. The Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this and thought, if this man really were a prophet, he would know what sort of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Jesus spoke up. Simon, I have something to say to you. Simon replied, Teacher, you're free to speak. So Jesus said, Two men owed a moneylender some money. 
One owed him 500 silver coins and the other owed him 50. When they couldn't pay it back, he was kind enough to cancel their debts. Now, who do you think will love him the most? Simon answered, I suppose the one who had the largest debt canceled. Jesus said to him, You're right. Then turning to the woman, he said to Simon, You see this woman, don't you? I came into your house. You didn't wash my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You didn't give me a kiss, but ever since I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You didn't put any olive oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. That's why I'm telling you that her many sins have been forgiven. Her great love proves that. But whoever receives little forgiveness loves very little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins have been forgiven. The other guest thought, Who is this man who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Chapter 8 after this, Jesus traveled from one city and village to another. He spread the good news about God's kingdom. The twelve apostles were with him. Also, some women were with him. They had been cured from evil spirits and various illnesses. These women were Mary, also called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, Joanna, whose husband Chusa was Herod's administrator, Susanna, and many other women. They provided financial support for Jesus and his disciples. When a large crowd had gathered and people had come to Jesus from every city, he used this story as an illustration. A farmer went to plant his seeds. Some seeds were planted along the road, were trampled, and were devoured by birds. Others were planted on rocky soil. When the plants came up, they withered because they had no moisture. Others were planted among thorn bushes. The thorn bushes grew up with them and choked them. Others were planted on good ground. When they came up, they produced a hundred times as much as was planted. After he had said this, he called out, Let the person who has ears listen. His disciples asked him what this story meant. Jesus answered, Knowledge about the mysteries of the kingdom of God has been given directly to you, but it is given to others in stories. When they look, they don't see, and when they hear, they don't understand. This is what the story illustrates. The seed is God's word. Some people are like seeds that were planted along the road. They hear the word, but then the devil comes. He takes the word away from them so that they don't believe and become saved. Some people are like seeds on rocky soil. They welcome the word with joy whenever they hear it, but they don't develop any roots. They believe for a while, but when their faith is tested, they abandon it. The seeds that were planted among thorn bushes are people who hear the word, but as life goes on, the worries, riches, and pleasures of life choke them, so they don't produce anything good. The seeds that were planted on good ground are people who also hear the word, but they keep it in their good and honest hearts and produce what is good despite what life may bring. No one lights a lamp and hides it under a bowl or puts it under a bed. Instead, everyone who lights a lamp puts it on a lampstand so that those who come in will see the light. There is nothing hidden that will not be revealed. There is nothing kept secret that will not come to light. So pay attention to how you listen. Those who understand these mysteries will be given more knowledge. However, some people don't understand these mysteries. Even what they think they understand will be taken away from them. His mother and his brothers came to see him, but they couldn't meet with him because of the crowd. Someone told Jesus, Your mother and your brothers are standing outside. They want to see you. He answered them, My mother and my brothers are those who hear and do what God's word says. One day, Jesus and his disciples got into a boat. He said to them, Let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they started out. As they were sailing along, Jesus fell asleep. A violent storm came across the lake. The boat was taking on water, and they were in danger. They went to him, woke him up, and said, Master, Master, we're going to die. Then he got up and ordered the wind and the waves to stop. The wind stopped, and the sea became calm. He asked them, Where is your faith? Frightened and amazed, they ask each other, Who is this man? He gives orders to the wind and the water, and they obey him. They landed in the region of the Gerasenes across from Galilee. When Jesus stepped out on the shore, a certain man from the city met him. The man was possessed by demons and had not worn clothes for a long time. 
He would not stay in a house, but lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he shouted, fell in front of him, and said in a loud voice, Why are you bothering me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I beg you not to torture me. Jesus ordered the evil spirit to come out of the man. The evil spirit had controlled the man for a long time. People had kept him under guard. He was chained hand and foot, but he would break the chains. Then the demon would force him to go into the desert. Jesus asked him, What is your name? He answered, Legion 6,000. Many demons had entered him. The demons begged Jesus not to order them to go into the bottomless pit. A large herd of pigs was feeding on a mountainside. The demons begged Jesus to let them enter those pigs, so he let them do this. The demons came out of the man and went into the pigs. Then the herd rushed down the cliff into the lake and drowned. When those who had taken care of the pigs saw what had happened, they ran away. They reported everything in the city and countryside. The people went to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone out. Dressed and in his right mind, he was sitting at Jesus' feet. The people were frightened. Those who had seen this told the people how Jesus had restored the demon-possessed man to health. Then all the people from the surrounding region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave because they were terrified. Jesus got into a boat and started back. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged him, let me go with you. But Jesus sent the man away and told him, go home to your family and tell them how much God has done for you. So the man left. He went through the whole city and told people how much Jesus had done for him. When Jesus came back, a crowd welcomed him. Everyone was expecting him. A man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, arrived and quickly bowed down in front of Jesus. He begged Jesus to come to his home. His only daughter, who was about 12 years old, was dying. As Jesus went, the people were crowding around him. A woman who had been suffering from chronic bleeding for 12 years was in the crowd. No one could cure her. She came up behind Jesus, touched the edge of his clothes, and her bleeding stopped at once. Jesus asked, Who touched me? After everyone denied touching him, Peter said, Teacher, the people are crowding you and pressing against you. Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know power has gone out of me. The woman saw that she couldn't hide. Trembling, she quickly bowed in front of him. There in front of all the people, she told why she touched him and how she was cured at once. Jesus told her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While Jesus was still speaking to her, someone came from the synagogue leader's home. He said, Your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. When Jesus heard this, he told the synagogue leader, Don't be afraid. Just believe and she will get well. Jesus went into the house. He allowed no one to go with him except Peter, John, James, and the child's parents. Everyone was crying and showing how sad they were. Jesus said, Don't cry. She's not dead. She's just sleeping. They laughed at him because they knew she was dead. But Jesus took her hand and called out, Child, get up. She came back to life and got up at once. He ordered her parents to give her something to eat. They were amazed. Jesus ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. Chapter 9 Jesus called the twelve apostles together and gave them power and authority over every demon and power and authority to cure diseases. He sent them to spread the message about the kingdom of God and to cure the sick. He told them, Don't take anything along on the trip. Don't take a walking stick, traveling bag, any food, money, or a change of clothes. When you go into a home, stay there until you're ready to leave. If people don't welcome you, leave that city and shake its dust off your feet as a warning to them. The apostles went from village to village, told the good news, and cured the sick everywhere. Herod the ruler heard about everything that was happening. He didn't know what to make of it. Some people were saying that John had come back to life. Others said that Elijah had appeared, and still others said that one of the prophets from long ago had come back to life. Herod said, I had John's head cut off. Who is this person I am hearing so much about? So Herod wanted to see Jesus. The apostles came back and told Jesus everything they had done. He took them with him to a city called Bethsaida so that they could be alone. But the crowds found out about this and followed him. He welcomed them, talked to them about the kingdom of God, and cured those who were sick. Toward the end of the day, the twelve apostles came to him. They said to him, Send the crowd to the closest villages and farms so that they can find some food and a place to stay. No one lives around here. Jesus replied, You give them something to eat. They said to him, We have five loaves of bread and two fish. Unless we go to buy food for all these people, that's all we have. There were about five thousand men. Then he told his disciples, Have them sit in groups of about fifty. So they did this. 
Then he took the five loaves and the two fish, looked up to heaven, and blessed the food. He broke the loaves apart and kept giving them to the disciples to give to the crowd. All of them ate as much as they wanted. When they picked up the leftover pieces, they filled twelve baskets. Once when Jesus was praying privately and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They answered, Some say you are John the baptizer, others Elijah, and still others say that one of the prophets from long ago has come back to life. He asked them, But who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah whom God has sent. He ordered them not to tell this to anyone. Jesus said that the Son of Man would have to suffer a lot. He would be rejected by the leaders, the chief priests, and the scribes. He would be killed, but on the third day he would come back to life. He said to all of them, Those who want to come with me must say no to the things they want, pick up their crosses every day, and follow me. Those who want to save their lives will lose them, but those who lose their lives for me will save them. What good does it do for people to win the whole world but lose their lives by destroying them? If people are ashamed of me and what I say, the Son of Man will be ashamed of those people when he comes in the glory that he shares with the Father and the holy angels. I can guarantee this truth. Some people who are standing here will not die until they see the kingdom of God. About eight days after he had said this, Jesus took Peter, John, and James with him and went up to a mountain to pray. While Jesus was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, both Moses and Elijah were talking with him. They appeared in heavenly glory and were discussing Jesus' approaching death and what he was about to fulfill in Jerusalem. Peter and the men with him were sleeping soundly. When they woke up, they saw Jesus' glory and the two men standing with him. As Moses and Elijah were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Teacher, it's good that we're here. Let's put up three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Peter didn't know what he was saying. While he was saying this, a cloud overshadowed them. They were frightened as they went into the cloud. A voice came out of the cloud and said, This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. After the voice had spoken, they saw that Jesus was alone. The disciples said nothing, and for some time they told no one about what they had seen. The next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a large crowd met Jesus. A man in the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He's my only child. Whenever a spirit takes control of him, he shrieks, goes into convulsions, and foams at the mouth. After a struggle, the spirit goes away, leaving the child worn out. I beg your disciples to force the spirit out of him, but they couldn't do it. Jesus answered, You unbelieving and corrupt generation, how long must I be with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming to Jesus, the demon knocked the boy to the ground and threw him into convulsions. Jesus ordered the evil spirit to leave. He cured the boy and gave him back to his father. Everyone was amazed to see God's wonderful power. Everyone was amazed at all the things that Jesus was doing. So he said to his disciples, listen carefully to what I say. The Son of Man will be betrayed and handed over to people. They didn't know what he meant. The meaning was hidden from them so that they didn't understand it. Besides, they were afraid to ask him about what he had said. A discussion started among them about who would be the greatest. Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he took a little child and had him stand beside him. Then he said to them, Whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. Whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. The one who is least among all of you is the one who is greatest. John replied, Master, we saw someone forcing demons out of a person by using the power and authority of your name. We tried to stop him because he was not one of us. Jesus said to him, Don't stop him. Whoever isn't against you is for you. The time was coming closer for Jesus to be taken to heaven, so he was determined to go to Jerusalem. He sent messengers ahead of him. They went into a Samaritan village to arrange a place for him to stay, but the people didn't welcome him because he was on his way to Jerusalem. James and John, his disciples, saw this. They asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to burn them up? But he turned and corrected them, so they went to another village. As they were walking along the road, a man said to Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. Jesus told him, Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to sleep. He told another man, Follow me. But the man said, Sir, first let me go to bury my father. But Jesus told him, Let the dead bury their own dead. You must go everywhere and tell about the kingdom of God. 
Another said, I'll follow you, sir, but first let me tell my family goodbye. Jesus said to him, whoever starts to plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Chapter 10 After this, the Lord appointed 70 other disciples to go ahead of him to every city and place that he intended to go. They were to travel in pairs. He told them, The harvest is large, but the workers are few. So ask the Lord who gives this harvest to send workers to harvest his crops. Go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Don't carry a wallet, a traveling bag, or sandals, and don't stop to greet anyone on the way. Whenever you go into a house, greet the family right away with the words, May there be peace in this house. If a peaceful person lives there, your greeting will be accepted. But if that's not the case, your greeting will be rejected. Stay with the family that accepts you. Eat and drink whatever they offer you. After all, the worker deserves his pay. Do not move around from one house to another. Whenever you go into a city and the people welcome you, eat whatever they serve you. Heal the sick that are there and tell the people, the kingdom of God is near you. But whenever you go into a city and people don't welcome you, leave. Announce in its streets, we are wiping your city's dust from our feet in protest against you. But realize that the kingdom of God is near you. I can guarantee that Judgment Day will be easier for Sodom than for that city. How horrible it will be for you, Chorazin. How horrible it will be for you, Bethsaida. If the miracles worked in your cities had been worked in Tyre and Sidon, they would have changed the way they thought and acted. Long ago they would have worn sackcloth and sat in ashes. Judgment Day will be better for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to heaven? No you will go to hell. The person who hears you hears me, and the person who rejects you rejects me. The person who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The 70 disciples came back very happy. They said, Lord, even demons obey us when we use the power and authority of your name. Jesus said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like lightning. I have given you the authority to trample snakes and scorpions and to destroy the enemy's power. Nothing will hurt you. However, don't be happy that evil spirits obey you. Be happy that your names are written in heaven. In that hour, the Holy Spirit filled Jesus with joy. Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, for hiding these things from wise and intelligent people and revealing them to little children. Yes, Father, this is what pleased you. My Father has turned everything over to me. Only the Father knows who the Son is, and no one knows who the Father is except the Son and those to whom the Son is willing to reveal him. He turned to his disciples in private and said to them, How blessed you are to see what you've seen. I can guarantee that many prophets and kings wanted to see and hear what you've seen and heard, but they didn't. Then an expert in Moses' teaching stood up to test Jesus. He asked, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus answered him, What is written in Moses' teachings? What do you read there? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Jesus told him, You're right. Do this, and life will be yours. But the man wanted to justify his question, so he asked Jesus, Who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man went from Jerusalem to Jericho. On the way, robbers stripped him, beat him, and left him for dead. By chance, a priest was traveling along that road. When he saw the man, he went around him and continued on his way. Then a Levite came to that place. When he saw the man, he too went around him and continued on his way. But a Samaritan, as he was traveling along, came across the man. When the Samaritan saw him, he felt sorry for the man, went to him, and cleaned and bandaged his wounds. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, the Samaritan took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. He told the innkeeper, Take care of him. If you spend more than that, I'll pay you on my return trip. Of these three men, who do you think was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by robbers? The expert said, the one who was kind enough to help him. Jesus told him, go and imitate his example. 
As they were traveling along, Jesus went into a village. A woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary. Mary sat at the Lord's feet and listened to him talk. But Martha was upset about all the work she had to do. So she asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work all by myself? Tell her to help me. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you worry and fuss about a lot of things. There's only one thing you need. Mary has made the right choice, and that one thing will not be taken away from her. Chapter 11 Once Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he stopped praying, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. Jesus told them, When you pray, say this, Father, let your name be kept holy. Let your kingdom come. Give us our bread day by day. Forgive us as we forgive everyone else. Don't allow us to be tempted. Jesus said to his disciples, Suppose one of you has a friend. Suppose you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, let me borrow three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a trip has dropped in on me, and I don't have anything to serve him. Your friend might answer you from inside his house, Don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children are in bed. I can't get up to give you anything. I can guarantee that although he doesn't want to get up to give you anything, he will get up and give you whatever you need because he is your friend and because you were so bold. So I tell you to ask and you will receive. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. Everyone who asks will receive. The one who searches will find. And for the person who knocks, the door will be opened. If your child asks you, his father, for a fish, would you give him a snake instead? Or if your child asks you for an egg, would you give him a scorpion? Even though you're evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children. So how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Jesus was forcing a demon out of a man. The demon had made the man unable to talk. When the demon had gone out, the man began to talk. The people were amazed, but some of them said, He can force demons out of people only with the help of Beelzebul, the ruler of demons. Others wanted to test Jesus and demanded that he show them some miraculous sign from heaven. Since Jesus knew what they were thinking, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is ruined. A house divided against itself falls. Now if Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom last? I say this because you say Beelzebul helps me force demons out of people. If I force demons out with the help of Beelzebul, who helps your followers force them out? That's why they will be your judges. But if I force out demons with the help of God's power, then the kingdom of God has come to you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own mansion, his property is safe. But a stronger man than he may attack him and defeat him. Then the stronger man will take away all the weapons in which the strong man trusted and will divide the loot. Whoever isn't with me is against me. Whoever doesn't gather with me scatters. When an evil spirit comes out of a person, it goes through dry places looking for a place to rest, but it doesn't find any. Then it says, I'll go back to the home I left. When it comes, it finds the house swept clean and in order. Then the spirit goes and brings along seven other spirits more evil than itself. They enter and take up permanent residence there. In the end, the condition of that person is worse than it was before. While Jesus was speaking, a woman in the crowd shouted, How blessed is the mother who gave birth to you and the breast that nursed you. Jesus replied, Rather, how blessed are those who hear and obey God's word. As the people were gathering around him, Jesus said, The people living today are evil. They look for a miraculous sign, but the only sign they will get is the sign of Jonah. Just as Jonah became a miraculous sign to the people of Nineveh, so the Son of Man will be a miraculous sign to the people living today. The Queen from the South will stand up at the time of judgment with the men who live today. She will condemn them because she came from the ends of the earth to hear Solomon's wisdom. But look! Someone greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the time of judgment with the people living today. Since the men of Nineveh turned to God and changed the way they thought and acted when Jonah spoke his message, they will condemn the people living today. But look, someone greater than Jonah is here. 
No one lights a lamp and hides it or puts it under a basket. Instead, everyone who lights a lamp puts it on a lampstand so that those who come in will see its light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is unclouded, your whole body is full of light. But when your eye is evil, your body is full of darkness. So be careful that the light in you isn't darkness. If your whole body is full of light and not darkness, it will be as bright as a lamp shining on you. After Jesus spoke, a Pharisee invited him to have lunch at his house, so Jesus accepted the invitation. The Pharisee was surprised to see that Jesus didn't wash before the meal. The Lord said to him, You Pharisees clean the outside of cups and dishes, but inside you are full of greed and evil. You fools! Didn't the one who made the outside make the inside too? Give what is inside as a gift to the poor, and then everything will be clean for you. How horrible it will be for you Pharisees! You give God one-tenth of your mint, spices, and every garden herb, but you have ignored justice and the love of God. You should have done these things without ignoring the others. How horrible it will be for you Pharisees! You love to sit in the front seats in the synagogues and to be greeted in the marketplaces. How horrible it will be for you! You are like unmarked graves. People walk on them without knowing what they are. One of the experts in Moses' teachings said to him, Teacher, when you talk this way, you insult us too. Jesus said, How horrible it will be for you experts in Moses' teachings. You burden people with loads that are hard to carry, but you won't lift a finger to carry any of these loads. How horrible it will be for you. You build the monuments for the prophets, but it was your ancestors who murdered them. So you are witnesses and approve of what your ancestors did. They murdered the prophets for whom you build monuments. That's why the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles. They will murder some of those prophets and apostles and persecute others. So the people living now will be charged with the murder of every prophet since the world was made. This includes the murders from Abel to Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the temple. Yes, I can guarantee this truth. The people living today will be held responsible for this. How horrible it will be for you experts in Moses' teachings. You have taken away the key that unlocks knowledge. You haven't gained entrance into knowledge yourselves, and you've kept out those who wanted to enter. When Jesus left, the scribes and the Pharisees held a terrible grudge against him. They questioned him about many things and watched him closely to trap him in something he might say. Chapter 12 Meanwhile, thousands of people had gathered. They were so crowded that they stepped on each other. Jesus spoke to his disciples and said, Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees. I'm talking about their hypocrisy. Nothing has been covered that will not be exposed. Whatever is secret will be made known. Whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight. Whatever you have whispered in private rooms will be shouted from the housetops. My friends, I can guarantee that you don't need to be afraid of those who kill the body. After that, they can't do anything more. I'll show you the one you should be afraid of. Be afraid of the one who has the power to throw you into hell after killing you. I'm warning you to be afraid of him. Aren't five sparrows sold for two cents? God doesn't forget any of them. Even every hair on your head has been counted. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. I can guarantee that the Son of Man will acknowledge in front of God's angels every person who acknowledges Him in front of others. But God's angels will be told that I don't know those people who tell others that they don't know me. Everyone who says something against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but the person who dishonors the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. When you are put on trial in synagogues or in front of rulers and authorities, don't worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say. At that time, the Holy Spirit will teach you what you must say. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to give me my share of the inheritance that our father left us. Jesus said to him, Who appointed me to be your judge or to divide your inheritance? He told the people, Be careful to guard yourselves from every kind of greed. Life is not about having a lot of material possessions. Then he used this illustration. He said, A rich man had land that produced good crops. He thought, What should I do? I don't have enough room to store my crops. He said, 
I know what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones so that I can store all my grain and goods in them. Then I'll say to myself, you've stored up a lot of good things for years to come. Take life easy, eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, you fool, I will demand your life from you tonight. Now who will get what you've accumulated? That's how it is when a person treasures material possessions and his riches don't serve God. Then Jesus said to his disciples, So I tell you to stop worrying about what you will eat or wear. Life is more than food and the body is more than clothes. Consider the crows. They don't plant or harvest. They don't even have a storeroom or a barn. Yet God feeds them. You are worth much more than birds. Can any of you add an hour to your life by worrying? If you can't do a small thing like that, why worry about other things? Consider how the flowers grow. They never work or spin yarn for clothes, but I say that not even Solomon in all his majesty was dressed like one of these flowers. That's the way God clothes the grass of the field. Today it's alive, and tomorrow it's thrown into an incinerator. So how much more will he clothe you people who have so little faith? Don't concern yourself about what you will eat or drink and quit worrying about these things. Everyone in the world is concerned about these things, but your Father knows you need them. Rather, be concerned about His kingdom. Then these things will be provided for you. Don't be afraid, little flock. Your Father is pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your material possessions and give the money to the poor. Make yourselves wallets that don't wear out. Make a treasure for yourselves in heaven that never loses its value. In heaven, thieves and moths can't get close enough to destroy your treasure. Your heart will be where your treasure is. Be ready for action and have your lamps burning. Be like servants waiting to open the door at their master's knock when he returns from a wedding. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. I can guarantee this truth. He will change his clothes, make them sit down at the table, and serve them. They will be blessed if he comes in the middle of the night or toward morning and finds them awake. Of course, you realize that if the homeowner had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let him break into his house. Be ready, because the Son of Man will return when you least expect him. Peter asked, Lord, did you use this illustration just for us or for everyone? The Lord asked, who then is the faithful skilled manager that the master will put in charge of giving the other servants their share of food at the right time? That servant will be blessed if his master finds him doing this job when he comes. I can guarantee this truth. He will put that servant in charge of all his property. On the other hand, that servant may think that his master is taking a long time to come home. The servant may begin to beat the other servants and to eat, drink, and get drunk. His master will return at an unexpected time. Then his master will punish him severely and assign him a place with unfaithful people. The servant who knew what his master wanted but didn't get ready to do it will receive a hard beating. But the servant who didn't know what his master wanted and did things for which he deserved punishment will receive a light beating. A lot will be expected from everyone who has been given a lot. More will be demanded from everyone who has been entrusted with a lot. I have come to throw fire on the earth. I wish that it had already started. I have a baptism to go through and I will suffer until it is over. Do you think that I came to bring peace to earth? No. I can guarantee that I came to bring nothing but division. From now on, a family of five will be divided. Three will be divided against two and two against three. A father will be against his son and a son against his father. A mother will be against her daughter and a daughter against her mother. A mother-in-law will be against her daughter-in-law and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Jesus said to the crowds, when you see a cloud coming up in the west, you immediately say, there's going to be a rainstorm, and it happens. When you see a south wind blowing, you say, it's going to be hot, and that's what happens. You hypocrites, you can forecast the weather by judging the appearance of earth and sky, but for some reason, you don't know how to judge the time in which you're living. So why don't you judge for yourselves what is right? For instance, when an opponent brings you to court in front of a ruler, do your best to settle with him before you get there. Otherwise, he will drag you in front of a judge. The judge will hand you over to an officer who will throw you into prison. I can guarantee that you won't get out until you pay every penny of your fine. Chapter 13 At that time, some people reported to Jesus about some Galileans whom Pilate had executed while they were sacrificing animals. Jesus replied to them, Do you think that this happened to them because they were more sinful than other people from Galilee? No, I can guarantee that they weren't. 
But if you don't turn to God and change the way you think and act, then you too will all die. What about those 18 people who died when the tower at Siloam fell on them? Do you think that they were more sinful than other people living in Jerusalem? No, I can guarantee that they weren't. But if you don't turn to God and change the way you think and act, then you too will all die. Then Jesus used this illustration. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard. He went to look for fruit on the tree but didn't find any. He said to the gardener, For the last three years I've come to look for figs on this fig tree but haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up good soil? The gardener replied, Sir, let it stand for one more year. I'll dig around it and fertilize it. Maybe next year it'll have figs. But if not, then cut it down. Jesus was teaching in a synagogue on the day of worship. A woman who was possessed by a spirit was there. The spirit had disabled her for 18 years. She was hunched over and couldn't stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her to come to him and said, Woman, you are free from your disability. He placed his hands on her, and she immediately stood up straight and praised God. The synagogue leader was irritated with Jesus for healing on the day of worship. The leader told the crowd, There are six days when work can be done, so come on one of those days to be healed. Don't come on the day of worship. The Lord said, You hypocrites! Don't each of you free your ox or donkey on the day of worship? Don't you then take it out of its stall and give it some water to drink? Now here is a descendant of Abraham. Satan has kept her in this condition for 18 years. Isn't it right to free her on the day of worship? As he said this, everyone who opposed him felt ashamed, but the entire crowd was happy about the miraculous things he was doing. Jesus asked, What is the kingdom of God like? What can I compare it to? It's like a mustard seed that someone planted in a garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds nested in its branches. He asked again, What can I compare the kingdom of God to? It's like yeast that a woman mixed into a large amount of flour until the yeast worked its way through all the dough. Then Jesus traveled and taught in one city and village after another on his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Sir, are only a few people going to be saved? He answered, Try hard to enter through the narrow door. I can guarantee that many will try to enter, but they won't succeed. After the homeowner gets up and closes the door, it's too late. You can stand outside, knock at the door, and say, Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer you, I don't know who you are. Then you will say, We ate and drank with you, and you taught in our streets. But he will tell you, I don't know who you are. Get away from me, all you evil people. Then you will cry and be in extreme pain. That's what you'll do when you see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the prophets. They'll be in the kingdom of God, but you'll be thrown out. People will come from all over the world and will eat in the kingdom of God. Some who are last will be first, and some who are first will be last. At that time, some Pharisees told Jesus, Get out of here and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. Jesus said to them, Tell that fox that I will force demons out of people and heal people today and tomorrow. I will finish my work on the third day. But I must be on my way today, tomorrow, and the next day. It's not possible for a prophet to die outside Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you kill the prophets and stone to death those sent to you. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Your house will be abandoned. I can guarantee that you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Chapter 14 On a day of worship, Jesus went to eat at the home of a prominent Pharisee. The guests were watching Jesus very closely. A man whose body was swollen with fluid was there. Jesus reacted by asking the Pharisees and the experts in Moses' teachings, Is it right to heal on the day of worship or not? But they didn't say a thing. So Jesus took hold of the man, healed him, and sent him away. Jesus asked them, If your son or your ox falls into a well on a day of worship, wouldn't you pull him out immediately? They couldn't argue with him about this. Then Jesus noticed how the guests always chose the places of honor, so he used this illustration when he spoke to them. When someone invites you to a wedding, don't take the place of honor. Maybe someone more important than you was invited. Then your host would say to you, give this person your place. 
Embarrassed, you would have to take the place of least honor. So when you're invited, take the place of least honor. Then when your host comes, he will tell you, friend, move to a more honorable place. Then all the other guests will see how you are honored. Those who honor themselves will be humbled, but people who humble themselves will be honored. Then he told the man who had invited him, when you invite people for lunch or dinner, don't invite only your friends, family, other relatives, or rich neighbors. Otherwise, they will return the favor. Instead, when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the handicapped, the lame, and the blind. Then you will be blessed because they don't have any way to pay you back. You will be paid back when those who have God's approval come back to life. One of those eating with him heard this. So he said to Jesus, The person who will be at the banquet in the kingdom of God is blessed. Jesus said to him, A man gave a large banquet and invited many people. When it was time for the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who were invited, Come, everything is ready now. Everyone asked to be excused. The first said to him, I bought a field and I need to see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I bought five pairs of oxen and I'm on my way to see how well they plow. Please excuse me. Still another said, I recently got married and that's why I can't come. The servant went back to report this to his master. Then the master of the house became angry. He told his servant, run to every street and alley in this city. Bring back the poor, the handicapped, the blind, and the lame. The servant said, sir, what you've ordered has been done, but there is still room for more people. Then the master told his servant, go to the roads and paths. Urge the people to come to my house. I want it to be full. I can guarantee that none of those invited earlier will taste any food at my banquet. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. He turned to them and said, If people come to me and are not ready to abandon their fathers, mothers, wives, children, brothers, and sisters, as well as their own lives, they cannot be my disciples. So those who do not carry their crosses and follow me cannot be my disciples. Suppose you want to build a tower. You would first sit down and figure out what it costs. Then you would see if you have enough money to finish it. Otherwise, if you lay a foundation and can't finish the building, everyone who watches will make fun of you. They'll say, this person started to build but couldn't finish the job. Or suppose a king is going to war against another king. He would first sit down and think things through. Can he and his 10,000 soldiers fight against a king with 20,000 soldiers? If he can't, he'll send ambassadors to ask for terms of peace while the other king is still far away. In the same way, none of you can be my disciples unless you give up everything. Salt is good, but if salt loses its taste, how will you restore its flavor? It's not any good for the ground or for the manure pile. People throw it away. Let the person who has ears listen. Chapter 15 All the tax collectors and sinners came to listen to Jesus. But the Pharisees and scribes complained, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Jesus spoke to them using this illustration. Suppose a man has 100 sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 sheep grazing in the pasture and look for the lost sheep until he finds it? When he finds it, he's happy. He puts that sheep on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says to them, Let's celebrate! I've found my lost sheep! I can guarantee that there will be more happiness in heaven over one person who turns to God and changes the way he thinks and acts than over 99 people who already have turned to God and have his approval. Suppose a woman has 10 coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and look for the coin carefully until she finds it? When she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, let's celebrate, I found the coin that I lost. So I can guarantee that God's angels are happy about one person who turns to God and changes the way he thinks and acts. Then Jesus said, a man had two sons. The younger son said to his father, Father, give me my share of the property. So the father divided his property between his two sons. After a few days, the younger son gathered his possessions and left for a country far away from home. There he wasted everything he had on a wild lifestyle. He had nothing left when a severe famine spread throughout that country. 
He had nothing to live on, so he got a job from someone in that country and was sent to feed pigs in the fields. No one in the country would give him any food, and he was so hungry that he would have eaten what the pigs were eating. Finally, he came to his senses. He said, how many of my father's hired men have more food than they can eat while I'm starving to death here? I'll go at once to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and you. I don't deserve to be called your son anymore. Make me one of your hired men. So he went at once to his father. While he was still at a distance, his father saw him and felt sorry for him. He ran to his son, put his arms around him, and kissed him. Then his son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and you. I don't deserve to be called your son anymore. The father said to his servants, Hurry, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let's celebrate with a feast. My son was dead and has come back to life. He was lost but has been found. Then they began to celebrate. His older son was in the field. As he was coming back to the house, he heard music and dancing. He called to one of the servants and asked what was happening. The servant told him, your brother has come home, so your father has killed the fattened calf to celebrate your brother's safe return. Then the older son became angry and wouldn't go into the house. His father came out and begged him to come in, but he answered his father, all these years I've worked like a slave for you. I've never disobeyed one of your commands, yet you've never given me so much as a little goat for a celebration with my friends. But this son of yours spent your money on prostitutes, and when he came home, you killed the fattened calf for him. His father said to him, My child, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. But we have something to celebrate, something to be happy about. This brother of yours was dead, but has come back to life. He was lost, but has been found. Chapter 16 then Jesus said to his disciples, a rich man had a business manager. The manager was accused of wasting the rich man's property. So the rich man called for his manager and said to him, what's this I hear about you? Let me examine your books. It's obvious that you can't manage my property any longer. The manager thought, what should I do? My master is taking my job away from me. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that people will welcome me into their homes when I've lost my job. So the manager called for each one of his master's debtors. He said to the first, how much do you owe my master? The debtor replied, 800 gallons of olive oil. The manager told him, take my master's ledger. Quick, sit down and write 400. Then he asked another debtor, how much do you owe? The debtor replied, a thousand bushels of wheat. The manager told him, take the ledger and write 800. The master praised the dishonest manager for being so clever. Worldly people are more clever than spiritually minded people when it comes to dealing with others. Jesus continued, I'm telling you that although wealth is often used in dishonest ways, you should use it to make friends for yourselves. When life is over, you will be welcomed into an eternal home. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with a lot. Whoever is dishonest with very little is dishonest with a lot. Therefore, if you can't be trusted with wealth that is often used dishonestly, who will trust you with wealth that is real? If you can't be trusted with someone else's wealth, who will give you your own? A servant cannot serve two masters. He will hate the first master and love the second, or he will be devoted to the first and despise the second. You cannot serve God and wealth. The Pharisees, who love money, heard all this and were making sarcastic remarks about him. So Jesus said to them, You try to justify your actions in front of people, but God knows what's in your hearts. What is important to humans is disgusting to God. Moses' teachings and the prophets were in force until the time of John. Since that time, people have been telling the good news about the kingdom of God, and everyone is trying to force their way into it. It is easier for the earth and the heavens to disappear than to drop a comma from Moses' teachings. Any man who divorces his wife to marry another woman is committing adultery. The man who marries a woman divorced in this way is committing adultery. There was a rich man who wore expensive clothes. Every day was like a party to him. There was also a beggar named Lazarus who was regularly brought to the gate of the rich man's house. 
Lazarus would have eaten any scraps that fell from the rich man's table. Lazarus was covered with sores, and dogs would lick them. One day the beggar died, and the angels carried him to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. He went to hell, where he was constantly tortured. As he looked up, in the distance he saw Abraham and Lazarus. He yelled, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water to cool off my tongue. I am suffering in this fire. Abraham replied, Remember, my child, that you had a life filled with good times, while Lazarus' life was filled with misery. Now he has peace here while you suffer. Besides, a wide area separates us. People couldn't cross it in either direction, even if they wanted to. The rich man responded, Then I ask you, Father, to send Lazarus back to my father's home. I have five brothers. He can warn them so that they won't end up in this place of torture. Abraham replied, They have Moses' teachings and the prophets. Your brothers should listen to them. The rich man replied, No, Father Abraham. If someone comes back to them from the dead, they will turn to God and change the way they think and act. Abraham answered him, if they won't listen to Moses' teachings and the prophets, they won't be persuaded even if someone comes back to life. Chapter 17 Jesus told his disciples, Situations that cause people to lose their faith are certain to arise, but how horrible it will be for the person who causes someone to lose his faith. It would be best for that person to be thrown into the sea with a large stone hung around his neck than for him to cause one of these little ones to lose his faith. So watch yourselves. If a believer sins, correct him. If he changes the way he thinks and acts, forgive him. Even if he wrongs you seven times in one day and comes back to you seven times and says that he is sorry, forgive him. Then the apostle said to the Lord, Give us more faith. The Lord said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, pull yourself up by the roots and plant yourself in the sea, and it would obey you. Suppose someone has a servant who is plowing fields or watching sheep. Does he tell his servant when he comes from the field, have something to eat? No. Instead, he tells his servant, get dinner ready for me. After you serve me my dinner, you can eat yours. He doesn't thank the servant for following orders. That's the way it is with you. When you've done everything you're ordered to do, say, we're worthless servants. We've only done our duty. Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee on his way to Jerusalem. As he went into a village, ten men with a skin disease met him. They stood at a distance and shouted, Jesus, teacher, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he told them, show yourselves to the priests. As they went, they were made clean. When one of them saw that he was healed, he turned back and praised God in a loud voice. He quickly bowed at Jesus' feet and thanked him. The man was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Weren't ten men made clean? Where are the other nine? Only this foreigner came back to praise God. Jesus told the man, Get up and go home. Your faith has made you well. The Pharisees asked Jesus when the kingdom of God would come. He answered them, people can't observe the coming of the kingdom of God. They can't say, here it is or there it is. You see, the kingdom of God is within you. Jesus said to his disciples, the time will come when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. People will say, there he is or here he is. Don't run after those people. The day of the Son of Man will be like lightning that flashes from one end of the sky to the other. But first he must suffer a lot and be rejected by the people of his day. When the Son of Man comes again, the situation will be like the time of Noah. People were eating, drinking, and getting married until the day that Noah went into the ship. Then the flood destroyed all of them. The situation will also be like the time of Lot. People were eating, drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day that Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from the sky and destroyed all of them. The day when the Son of Man is revealed will be like that. On that day, those who were on the roof shouldn't come down to get their belongings out of their houses. Those who were in the field shouldn't turn back, remember Lot's wife. Those who try to save their lives will lose them, and those who lose their lives will save them. 
I can guarantee that on that night, if two people are in one bed, one will be taken and the other one will be left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other one will be left. They asked him, Where, Lord? Jesus told them, Vultures will gather wherever there is a dead body. Chapter 18 Jesus used this illustration with his disciples to show them that they need to pray all the time and never give up. He said, In a city there was a judge who didn't fear God or respect people. In that city there was also a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice. For a while the judge refused to do anything, but then he thought, This widow really annoys me. Although I don't fear God or respect people, I'll have to give her justice. Otherwise, she'll keep coming to me until she wears me out. The Lord added, pay attention to what the dishonest judge thought. Won't God give his chosen people justice when they cry out to him for help day and night? Is he slow to help them? I can guarantee that he will give them justice quickly. But when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Jesus also used this illustration with some who were sure that God approved of them while they looked down on everyone else. He said, Two men went into the temple courtyard to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other was a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. I'm not a robber or a dishonest person. I haven't committed adultery. I'm not even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of my entire income. But the tax collector was standing at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven. Instead, he became very upset and he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I can guarantee that this tax collector went home with God's approval, but the Pharisee didn't. Everyone who honors himself will be humbled, but the person who humbles himself will be honored. Some people brought infants to Jesus to have him hold them. When the disciples saw this, they told the people not to do that. But Jesus called the infants to him and said, Don't stop the children from coming to me. Children like these are part of the kingdom of God. I can guarantee this truth. Whoever doesn't receive the kingdom of God as a little child receives it will never enter it. An official asked Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God. You know the commandments. Never commit adultery. Never murder. Never steal. Never give false testimony. Honor your father and your mother. The official replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was a boy. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still need one thing. Sell everything you have. Distribute the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then follow me. When the official heard this, he became sad because he was very rich. Jesus watched him and said, How hard it is for rich people to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard him asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus said, The things that are impossible for people to do are possible for God to do. Then Peter said, We've left everything to follow you. Jesus said to them, I can guarantee this truth. Anyone who gave up his home, wife, brothers, parents, or children because of the kingdom of God will certainly receive many times as much in this life and will receive eternal life in the world to come. Jesus took the twelve apostles aside and said to them, We're going to Jerusalem. Everything that the prophets wrote about the Son of Man will come true. He will be handed over to foreigners. They will make fun of him, insult him, spit on him, whip him, and kill him. But on the third day he will come back to life. But they didn't understand any of this. What he said was a mystery to them, and they didn't know what he meant. As Jesus came near Jericho, a blind man was sitting and begging by the road. When he heard the crowd going by, he tried to find out what was happening. The people told him that Jesus from Nazareth was passing by. Then the blind man shouted, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. The people at the front of the crowd told the blind man to be quiet, but he shouted even louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered them to bring the man to him. When the man came near, Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said, Lord, I want to see again. Jesus told him, Receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. Immediately he could see again. He followed Jesus and praised God. All the people saw this, and they too praised God. 
chapter 20. One day, Jesus was teaching the people in the temple courtyard and telling them the good news. The chief priests, scribes, and leaders came up to him. They asked him, Tell us, what gives you the right to do these things? Who told you that you could do this? Jesus answered them, I too have a question for you. Tell me, did John's right to baptize come from heaven or from humans? They talked about this among themselves. They said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, why didn't you believe him? But if we say from humans, everyone will stone us to death. They're convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they didn't know who gave John the right to baptize. Jesus told them, then I won't tell you why I have the right to do these things. Then, using this illustration, Jesus spoke to the people. A man planted a vineyard, leased it to vineyard workers, and went on a long trip. At the right time, he sent a servant to the workers to obtain from them a share of the grapes from the vineyard. But the workers beat the servant and sent him back with nothing. So he sent a different servant. The workers beat him, treated him shamefully, and sent him back with nothing. Then he sent a third servant but they injured this one and threw him out of the vineyard. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what should I do? I'll send my son whom I love. They'll probably respect him. When the workers saw him, they talked it over among themselves. They said, this is the heir. Let's kill him so that the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will destroy these workers and give the vineyard to others. Those who heard him said, that's unthinkable. Then Jesus looked straight at them and asked, what then does this scripture verse mean? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken. If that stone falls on anyone, it will crush that person. The scribes and chief priests wanted to arrest him right there, but they were afraid of the people. They knew that he had directed this illustration at them. So they watched for an opportunity to send out some spies. The spies were to act like sincere religious people. They wanted to catch him saying the wrong thing so that they could hand him over to the governor. They asked him, Teacher, we know that you are right in what you say and teach. Besides, you don't play favorites. Rather, you teach the way of God truthfully. Is it right for us to pay taxes to the emperor or not? He saw through their scheme, so he said to them, Show me a coin. Whose face and name is this? They answered, The emperor's. He said to them, Well then, give the emperor what belongs to the emperor, and give God what belongs to God. They couldn't make him say anything wrong in front of the people. His answer surprised them, so they said no more. Some Sadducees, who say the people will never come back to life, came to Jesus. They asked him, Teacher, Moses wrote for us, If a married man dies and has no children, his brother should marry his widow and have children for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first got married and died without having children. Then the second brother married the widow, and so did the third. In the same way, all seven brothers married the widow, died, and left no children. Finally, the woman died. Now when the dead come back to life, whose wife will she be? The seven brothers had married her. Jesus said to them, in this world, people get married, but people who are considered worthy to come back to life and live in the next world will neither marry nor die anymore. They are the same as the angels. They are God's children who have come back to life. Even Moses showed in the passage about the bush that the dead come back to life. He says that the Lord is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. In God's sight, all people are living. Some scribes responded, Teacher, that was well said. From that time on, no one dared to ask him another question. Jesus said to them, How can people say that the Messiah is David's son? David says in the book of Psalms, The Lord said to my Lord, Take the highest position in heaven until I make your enemies your footstool. David calls him Lord, so how can he be his son? While all the people were listening, Jesus said to the disciples, Beware of the scribes. They like to walk around in long robes and love to be greeted in the marketplaces, to have the front seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at dinners. They rob widows by taking their houses and then say long prayers to make themselves look good. The scribes will receive the most severe punishment. Chapter 21 Looking up, Jesus saw people, especially the rich, dropping their gifts into the temple offering box. 
He noticed a poor widow drop in two small coins. He said, I can guarantee this truth. This poor widow has given more than all the others. All of these people have given what they could spare, but she, in her poverty, has given everything she had to live on. Some of the disciples were talking about the temple complex. They noted that it was built with fine stones and decorated with beautiful gifts. So Jesus said, about these buildings that you see, the time will come when not one of these stones will be left on top of another. Each one will be torn down. The disciples asked him, teacher, when will this happen? What will be the sign when all this will occur? Jesus said, be careful that you are not deceived. Many will come using my name. They will say, I am he, and the time is near. Don't follow them. When you hear of wars and revolutions, don't be terrified. These things must happen first, but the end will not come immediately. Then Jesus continued, Nation will fight against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be terrible earthquakes, famines, and dreadful diseases in various places. Terrifying sights and miraculous signs will come from the sky. Before all these things happen, people will arrest and persecute you. They will hand you over to their synagogues and put you into their prisons. They will drag you in front of kings and governors because of my name. It will be your opportunity to testify to them. So make up your minds not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves. I will give you words and wisdom that none of your enemies will be able to oppose or prove wrong. Even parents, brothers, relatives, and friends will betray you and kill some of you. Everyone will hate you because you are committed to me, but not a hair on your head will be lost. By your endurance, you will save your life. When you see armies camped around Jerusalem, realize that the time is near for it to be destroyed. Then those of you in Judea should flee to the mountains. Those of you in Jerusalem should leave it. Those of you in the fields shouldn't go back into them. This will be a time of vengeance. Everything that is written about it will come true. How horrible it will be for women who are pregnant or who are nursing babies in those days. Indeed, the land will suffer very hard times and its people will be punished. Sores will cut them down and they will be carried off into all nations as prisoners. Nations will trample Jerusalem until the time allotted for the nations to do this are over. Miraculous signs will occur in the sun, moon, and stars. The nations of the earth will be deeply troubled and confused because of the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint as they fearfully wait for what will happen to the world. Indeed, the powers of the universe will be shaken. Then people will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to happen, stand with confidence. The time when you will be set free is near. Then Jesus used this story as an illustration. Look at the fig tree or any other tree. As soon as leaves grow on them, you know without being told that summer is near. In the same way, when you see these things happen, you know that the kingdom of God is near. I can guarantee this truth. This generation will not disappear until all this takes place. The earth and the heavens will disappear, but my words will never disappear. Make sure that you don't become drunk, hungover, and worried about life. Then that day could suddenly catch you by surprise, like a trap that catches a bird. That day will surprise all people who live on the earth. Be alert at all times. Pray so that you have the power to escape everything that is about to happen and to stand in front of the Son of Man. During the day, Jesus would teach in the temple courtyard, but at night he would go to the Mount of Olives, as it was called, and spend the night there. All of the people would get up early to hear him speak in the temple courtyard. 